in the next sort of 30 minutes, the three of us uh, are going to talk about how to use Python and, and machine learning to analyze the data uh, I've obtained from mechanical ventilator of critically newborn infants. And uh, who is the three of us? So my name is Gustav Bertecki. I'm one of the neonatal consultants in Cambridge, work with sick neonates day and night. And on top of my um, job, I'm also interested in uh, my neonatal ventilation and Python and started to use Python a couple of years ago to look at uh, data uh, obtained from ventilators. Now, Ian, I don't need to introduce. Uh, he's one of the he's one of the uh, co-founders of Python London and one of the organizers of this meeting. He's also an experienced, uh, very experienced Python programmer and machine learning consultant and author of this book. Uh, Giles is a bioinformatician turned to um, Python programmer uh, and was also a member of the review committee for this meeting. And, and, and we have started this collaboration more than half a year ago uh, after PyCon UK and uh, presented some of the progress on, in PyData London in January. And, and this is a kind of follow-up presentation on that. And um, but first of all, um, why do some newborn babies still in, in the, um, today require mechanical ventilation? And the reason for that is mostly prematurity. They are, there's nothing wrong with them. They are born with premature lungs, premature muscles, premature brain, and they won't be able to uh, breed enough to support gas exchange and life without uh, ventilatory support. Um, in addition, some babies who are born full term, they can still require mechanical ventilation for some time because of an infection, birth depression, or a condition which requires surgery and anesthesia. So as a big neonatal unit in Cambridge, we ventilate approximately 1,500 ventilator days a year, which is like one patient ventilated for one day is one ventilator day. So we ventilate a lot, uh, similarly to other big neonatal units. And uh, ventilation is also an important part of adult and, and pediatric intensive care. Now, um, it says there, are, there are two different ventilators. One of them is from, from the 80s, and the other one is the one which we are currently using. And, um, and if you compare them, there is a big difference. And the big difference is that in the 80s, ventilators used to be primary mechanical devices. Sometimes they didn't even have electricity. They were completely gas driven. And, and what they do, they just created positive pressure, inflate the lung in a way set by the clinician, had no interactions whatsoever with the patient's own breathing effort. And uh, today, ventilators still have got their mechanical parts, but they are primary computers. And because of their computers, their powerful computers, uh, they are creating beneficial and harmful interactions, both uh, with the patient's own breathing effort. Because the other thing I would like to mention is that we very rarely sedate and muscle relax babies to a point that they don't breathe at all. This is not what modern neonatal medicine does. And because of that, because we are dealing with two pumps, um, during ment mechanical ventilation, most of the time, an active process, a spontaneous breathing done by the patient, and a mechanical ventilation, which is positive pressure ventilation done by the mechanical ventilator, there is always a, it's always a combination of, or superimposition actually, of these two pumps, creating complex interactions, which are still poorly understood. And one of the reasons why, why it's poorly understood is because uh, in the past, these ventilator data, which these modern ventilators provide, haven't been downloaded, haven't been analyzed. They were, the screens are looked at by the, by the clinician, but um, apart from individual graphs, there has been a no systematic analysis of, of these kind of waveforms. So what you can see on, on, on this waveform is, on the left side, uh, what you see is that, well, air only flows if there is a pressure difference. So what the ventilator does, in, in this case, which is then a baby who is not breathing at all on the left side, that creates positive pressure. That results in a positive flow, which goes into the patient. That's a inspiration, given inflation given by the ventilator. And then when that pressure released, then there is an expiration. So the flow goes down minus, air comes out of the lung spontaneously. So this creates a volume, which is then the breath. So it's very easy and, and simple to recognize this if there is no patient contribution. But once there is a patient contribution, like this baby is breathing spontaneously, then you would immediately see that, that for example, during the expiration of the ventilator here, uh, the patient started to breathe in. So the, the ventilator is trying to adapt to the patient, but that adaptation is not perfect. And, and this kind of adverse patient-ventilator interactions haven't been systematically looked at, haven't been quantified. 
Uh, clinicians recognize them when they look at the ventilator screen, but we don't know how many of them occurs, for example, in over 12 hours of ventilation. So I thought that would be an interesting question to ask. For example, if you look at a baby who, again, like several ventilations now, these are all individual breaths, uh, the patient who is not breathing still has got some sort of irregularity because of positioning and because of just uh, changes in, 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 a, in a baby's movement or nurse handling the baby. But if the baby is breathing, then everything becomes much more chaotic. Now, um, so I thought that, that um, it would be interesting to see what's happening during longer terms, long, in terms of longer terms, uh, during mechanical ventilation in these babies who are actually breathing spontaneously. So uh, initially starting as a service evaluation of the alarm activity of these ventilators, I've downloaded approximately 160 days worth of ventilator data uh, with 10, 100 hertz kind of sampling rate, which is like one, one data point. One, it's a time series data with one data point every 10 milliseconds. So this leads to uh, a large data set when you're recording for two to four days, which is the kind of typical recording length for me. So, uh, and then these data are retrieved um, as CSV files. So you're looking at approximately 600, 700 megabyte of data per um, ventilation day. So not much if you think for a whole unit's ventilation activity could be recorded on a kind of one terabyte disk, which is not done. We don't keep this data at the moment. Need, similarly to other hospitals, we never keep this data, they're just gonna be there. Uh, now, um, so mechanical ventilation um, is complex if there is an interaction between the ventilator and the patient. And, and what you can see on these curves is like three hours worth of ventilation, so approximately a million data points. And, and what you see is the x-axis is the pressure, now, the y-axis is the flow. So the pressure is responsible for the flow. Now, if, you are, if we are ventilating an artificial lung, which is just a dummy lung, doesn't have any interaction, clearly, uh, then you can kind of make all these individual dots look very similar to each other in terms of what pressure during the inspiratory arm, which is to the right side of this. So if you look at on the left side panel, it's a kind of curve. And the curve goes anticlockwise, like the inspiration is inspiratory arm, expiratory arm. So, so this is very straightforward, then the dots are on top of each other. But even in a baby who is sedated, you see a completely different picture. So this is because of ventilator-patient interaction. In other words, this patient had different flows at the same pressure level because it was interacting with the ventilator. And, and if you kind of, for example, have a breathing patient, then it becomes even more complex and you can actually find patterns in it, for example, um, um, this is a, this circled area is when the baby is starting to breathe. And the ventilator is sort of recognizing that breath starts and then trying to synchronize the breath next to it. So trying to create a beneficial patient ventilator interaction. That's when the uh, flow goes up, but the pressure not. So it's done by the patient rather than the ventilator. So, but you can find possibly other, 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 I mean, these are very primitive joint plots, but, uh, but you can find probably more important differences if you can look at individual breaths rather than three-hour activity of thousands of breaths. Now, uh, so the key aim for my perspective is to, in the longer term, is to provide the clinician with simple and quantitative indices of uh, ventilator-patient interactions. A simple because ventilation is only one part of our job and, and the clinician has got very little time to, to analyze complex patterns, so it needs to be something which is easily quantifiable. However, to develop something like that, uh, we need to look at individual breaths in isolation. Rather than creating these graphs with thousands of breaths cumulatively, we need to develop, needed to be able to split the trace into individual breaths, which then would require, um, then it's not feasible to do it manually. You can look at a screen, you can identify one breath from the many vi visually, but it's not feasible to do it on like a trace of 12 hours, which has a thousands of breaths. And that's why I think um, that's why I think I've become interested in this collaboration, and I'm, I'm, and my <laughs> com computer program colleagues are going to follow up on that. And I think this is where I'm stopping, and then I'm going to hand it over to 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 Jan. That's fine. Thank you very much. Can you hear that? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ian. Uh, I'm one of the founders of the Pi Data London uh, group and the conference series. Um, some of you would have met me before, not all of you, um, but like the orange shirts in the room, we're all volunteers here. Um, 
The reason we're collaborating on this project is that when I went to PyCon UK last year, um, over in Cardiff, great conference, I recommend you go, um, I met uh, Gustav, actually I was there a day later, and everyone was saying, Ian, you have to go and meet uh, Dr. Gustav Botecki. He's done this amazing uh, presentation about uh, babies and ventilator data, and he needs help with machine learning, and I reckon you'd love it, because you're here teaching machine learning, and that's what I was doing. Um, and so we sought each other out, went to the pub, of course, um, and then started to have a natter about this. Uh, and Gustav was just after a non-commercial collaboration, so there's no business funding behind this, uh, to further this, uh, the analysis of this data. So we started talking. Uh, I agreed the data looked amazing, um, and I wanted to play with more uh, time series data. So we, we started more beers, and then a collaboration that came out of that. Um, and so I quite like the fact that that conference led to a collaboration which leads to the opening of some of the work at this conference. And we keep pushing this message of collaboration. So it doesn't have, just have to be about the work we're doing um, in the office, of course. Um, this, all of this is about uh, collaborating and sharing ideas and doing interesting stuff. So I fully encourage this kind of thing. So um, what are the aims in this project from a data science perspective? Well, uh, babies breathe very fast. They take a breath approximately once every second. So overnight, that's 43,000 breaths. So those curves that you saw, there are 43,000 of those every night per baby. A doctor cannot sit there and analyze all of these to see which ones look good and which ones look bad. And yet they need to have some high level summary that the baby is breathing correctly on the, on the ventilator machine. So if we can summarize uh, when each breath is taking place, we can then start to apply some statistics to analyze that data and say which breaths look good, which breaths look bad, which pieces of the, the nighttime um, or the last uh, N hours uh, a doctor should go and check over. Um, but to do that, we have to do segmentation, which we'll cover shortly. Um, that lets us go on to do some really interesting other areas of analysis. One which we're about to start work on is this idea of auto-peep. Auto peep, a baby breathes in, their lung inflates, they have oxygen or gas in their lungs, they, uh, they breathe out, uh, the, the gas leaves their lungs, but then before it's fully expired, then the ventilator starts pushing more air in, so they haven't fully deflated. Then they breathe again, they expire, and then they don't fully uh, evacuate their lungs. And so leaving this positive pressure residual at the end of the breathing cycle can cause tissue damage, and so that's a bad thing for the baby. So if you can start to summarize how much air is going in and out of the lungs on every single of those 43,000 breathing cycles, you can begin to get an idea if the lungs are properly emptying or if they're being left partially filled at the end uh, of each breathing cycle. Um, so we have to start doing the segmentation so we can analyze that. And we're just getting to that point. And there's a whole bunch of other interesting things that we can use to, uh, to extend the statistical analysis of these uh, baby breaths once we can do the segmentation. So what does it mean to do the segmentation? So we saw a diagram like this uh, a bit earlier on. Uh, this is a longest time series trace. Uh, you can see these breaths are occurring once a second. So in a five second period, there are five of these breaths. On the orange side, we're seeing the flow. That's uh, one of the diagrams Gustav showed earlier. It's a bit like a sine wave, um, but compressed in time. So it goes up and then it comes down and then it goes back to zero. That's the flow, positive flow into the baby, decreasing until they stop sucking air in. And then the negative flow as they quickly uh, push some of the air out and then it returns to zero as their lungs are almost empty. And then that cycle repeats. And then at the top, we have the pressure in the airway. So that's the ventilator pushing air in if there's a large contribution. And when there are smaller contributions, that's when the ventilator not having to do so much work. It's still doing some work, but not doing so much work. So we can see babies breathing regularly. So we get these nice sinusoidal-like waves. And then we get periods where there's a long gap. And when this long gap occurs, either the baby isn't breathing or it's having trouble breathing. And the ventilator's waiting, and it's waiting, and it's waiting, and it goes, oh my god! And then it starts pushing air into the baby. So the baby gets a full breath of air. So we can see these long gaps. In this trace, you might just say, but it's easy, Ian. Look, you just look at that zero line, and whenever it starts to go up from there, that's the start of a breath. And would that it would be so easy. Um, but it turns out the data can get quite messy and quite dirty. And so we wanted to put in place the machine learning process to identify the areas that were easy to classify and the areas that were harder to classify. So what kind of summaries do we want out the other side? If you can segment every one of those breaths, by that I mean if you can draw a line in front of each of these orange uh, beginning of the sinusoidal wave, so the start rate goes up. Then we can start to measure things like the length of that wave. So how long is that breathing cycle? Is it a long breathing cycle or a short breathing cycle? 
If we can count many breathing cycles and look at the length of those, the deltas of each of those breath lengths, you can draw a histogram. So by you can do an eyeball check. In this period of time, we see a histogram that looks like this. We don't know what the right distribution is, we're analyzing this, um, but we can see an, a distribution that we expect. And if we saw, for example, fat tails coming out the side, we might say, well, that's a bit odd. There are lots of short breaths and lots of long breaths. Why is that? We should probably go and analyze that section. And if you look at those same deltas but plotted on a time series chart, then you can see periods where you get the same kind of regular breathing. So that's when things are looking pretty good over here, these nice regular breaths. And then when you get short breaths followed by long breaths, that's when the baby isn't breathing regularly for some reason, and the ventilator's waiting and the ventilator's causing uh, this manually added breath. And so you can see uh, periods of time when there's like a non-stationarity effect going on, things are changing. So that'll be a good period to summarize for a doctor to say, that's a period you should go and analyze overnight. And when there are 20,000 20, breaths that look stable, you haven't got to go and analyze those. But this bit, you should go and check on it. Now, often in machine learning projects, people go straight into the hardcore bit of the machine learning. Um, I wanted to step back a bit from that, knowing that there are a lot of beginners here. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about the phases of the project, and then Giles will take over some of the machine learning uh, in a moment. So the phases behind the project, the phases that started this collaboration. So we had to get CSV files out of Gustav. These are files, they're a million rows plus. Um, so they're bigger than will fit into Excel, so they're not easy to deal with from a non-programmer's point of view. But if you can put them into Python, then uh, with pandas, uh, you can start to look into the data and start to do some plots, of course. Um, one of the first questions is always, is my data sane? Does this, does this data represent what the, I think the machine is telling me? Um, and one of the, uh, the questions is, well, the, uh, the machine is giving me timestamps data. Of course, every timestamp is going to be unique and incrementing. Because of course you wouldn't have time series data going backwards in time or being repeated. It turns out that the timestamps are an issue. And if ever you've heard me talk before, you know that I always go on about gosh darn timestamps because they're always broken. Time data is always broken in our fresh data sets that come in. Um, luckily, um, there's uh, tools like Engard or your own checks that you can write that let you check if things like the timestamps are monotonically increasing and not duplicated because you don't want multiple timestamps of data coming out with the same actual timestamp. So Giles had to do some fixing to sort that out. But other than that, the data was good. It didn't wander all over the place. It didn't have random zeros speckled into it. It looked like pretty solid data. We moved on to an EDA phase, and so drawing lots of graphs, looking into the data, plotting 2D scatter plots, plotting time series plots, summarizing sections by hand, and then asking questions, what are the ranges like? Do things look sensible? Are we happy? Do we understand this? As non-clinicians, do we understand this data? And can we explain it back to a clinician in a way that they say, actually, yeah, you kind of understood it. So that was a nice phase. Then we had to get on with building a gold standard. So to do machine learning, you've got to have annotated data. We had a few annotations from Gustav at the beginning, but we didn't have lots of annotations. Uh, and so Giles talked about this. He built a tool to enable him to annotate the data, and he became a prototype clinician sitting there, clicking away at the start of every breath to annotate them, and then double checking those. Once we had that, we could build a very simple classifier using a SciPy function, a moving average, uh, multiple moving averages, uh, peak detection function, which gave us a kind of a clue as to where the peaks were. It wasn't super reliable, but it gave us a baseline to work from, and then we could work on with a random forest to build up a proper classifier. So that was the fun bit of the work. That was the other kind of 70% of the work. And if you haven't done this kind of project before on raw, unseen data, well, that's just a, a common thing. Uh, and technically, we used Jupyter Notebooks, used a lot of notebooks, um, and Git for sharing code between the three of us. We've only met physically four times, I think four times in six months, um, and Gitter, which is just like Slack, a uh, collaborative chat tool. Um, when we've used notebooks, often you end up developing a couple of cells and then copy-pasting the notebook and copy-pasting the notebook and copy-pasting all those shared cells of code. And that's a bit of a bad idea because any bug fix you do in one doesn't get shared amongst others. So I've developed, and it, there's an open source example of it, a modulized notebook, I call it. It's a bit like a Python module. You can do a Python setup.py develop, and then it points back to the root of your tree with all your notebooks in it. But then if you have a folder called tools and you put some tool functions in there, all of your notebooks can import from that tools folder. And so you can put all your shared code in there whilst developing locally. And if you want an example of that, just take a look in my GitHub, the research module layout template. Uh, and I'd love feedback on it. We've been using it for a couple of years on projects, um, but I'd love feedback from other people. 
Um, and also I'd like to thank all of these open source projects because without them we wouldn't have been able to collaborate to produce uh, this piece of work, um, particularly the Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, Bokeh has become pretty useful and we've done some nice work with it. Uh, it's all in Python 3. I'm a massive Python 3 proponent um, and Pandas uh, and Matplotlib and all built off of Anaconda. So I think at this point, Giles, I hand over to you. So if I give you that. Probably. <laughs> There we go. That'll do. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Right. Um, I won't talk at length about this uh, annotation tool. It's uh, something we covered at the meetup a um, couple of months ago. Um, but the, um, the first challenge in doing the machine learning uh, was to have a gold standard to work off, which meant that we had to annotate sufficient data to train a classifier. Um, so I annotated. Um, half a dozen traces, um, and four of those have annotated a good chunk of the data, so five minutes. Um, so that means about 300 breaths per trace. Um, so Bokeh was good for this because it allows you to pan and zoom around the, uh, the plots, and with IPy widget sliders, you can position indicators where you want to mark a timestamp that's the start of a breath. Um, so that's I'd recommend uh, using both of those tools for these sorts of annotation tasks. Uh, so the, um, the data that we used to train our classifier um, was 75 train, 25% test per patient. Um, so there's five minutes of data and we've got a very unbalanced uh, data set. We've got one positive sample out of 100. Um, uh, so this, there's one start of breath in 100 timestamps approximately. Um, so this is 100 hertz data and the breathing rate is about once per second. So having uh, annotated the data, we were able to build up a set of features that allowed the random forest that we uh, used on this to uh, identify the start of a breath uh, fairly reliably for most of the patients. Um, so those involve indicators, rate of change, cumulative volumes, and so on. Um, we made some assumptions about uh, the ranges of the values so that the classifier would see the size of these features um, being similar. Um, and we don't know quite how well this uh, approach will generalize, but uh, Gustav assures me that, for instance, flow is fairly consistent between patients. They don't vary in size too much. Um, so in order to diagnose uh, our results, so I developed a diagnostic tool. And here we have uh, the output, um, or one view of the output from the classifier, where we have uh, a uh, patient who is heavily sedated and therefore all the breathing effort is from the ventilator. So we have here approximately 75 very consistent breaths from the test set. And um, here, so they've been all been overlaid um, and the predicted start point for each of these is accurate. Um, so the inhalation portion to the left, the exhalation portion to the right of these plots um, and uh, at, in the subplot below we can see the prediction probabilities uh, from the random forest. Um, in fact that's just for the one of the samples that I've selected uh, using a widget. Um, and the manually annotated uh, start point of that breath um, is also marked at the same position in its subplot, but it's actually obscured because the random forest is making the prediction at, at that point. So the, there's just a, a hint of color here where you can see there's a very slight non-zero prediction, the sample before the true start of breath. So, so this is all good. When we get on to um, a more complicated data set than our classifier uh, struggles a little bit. So this patient um, 
is conscious and the ventilator is contributing, but there's a complex interaction between the, the patient and the ventilator, and these breaths are very inconsistent to the point where they're difficult to manually annotate. Uh, so here the, the true positives are uh, the gray lines again, um, but we also have false positives in red and false negatives in blue. And um, we can see that this data looks pretty messy. So I've used an IPI widget slider just to highlight one of the false negatives here. Um, and we can see that in this case, the infant started to breathe, but the effort's poor. Um, so this is the, the start of the breath. That peters out, and then the ventilator kicks in and initiates a backup breath, and then it continues <coughs> more or less normally. So if we look at the probabilities coming out of the classifier, we have our manually annotated start point here, and uh, we have the probabilities from the classifier in orange, and we see here that the classifier is actually predicting the start of breath at this point. Um, so it's easy to understand why that is. It's a bit more difficult to uh, create features that uh, help the classifier make the right choices. So the GUI tools, um, the two, two main ones, the annotation tool uh, was written with Bokeh and IPI widgets. And for the diagnosis tool, we used uh, Matplotlib, again with IPI widgets, in order to select the uh, particular uh, breath that we wanted to highlight. And that's <coughs> been very valuable to understand conditions where the classifier is not classifying a difficult breath correctly. Um, and there's lots of different ways in which the classification can fail. But actually, um, on this data set, we're still seeing uh, an F1 score of 0.9 on our training data and 0.88 <coughs> on our test data. So the results aren't bad, but we'd like to improve them. Uh, the IPI widgets team have been very responsive. So they've um, come forward with new features um, and helped me contribute a new feature. So I'd, I'd recommend um, using their tools. And if you find there's something that doesn't work for you, then it doesn't help. It doesn't hurt to ask. And if you decided you wanted to write some of these tools, it would take you maybe two or three days to do each one. So next steps. Um, the random forest does pretty well, and we can explain why we, we have an idea now what sort of features we need to generate to get a good result from the random forest. Um, we'd like to do more testing to see how well uh, classifiers trained on one patient uh, cope with data from another patient. Um, and we'd like to um, validate a bit more and then move on to the auto peep calculations and some other ideas that we have. Um, so we'd be interested to know how other people might have tackled similar issues. Um, and if you have any experience um, in other completely alternative approaches that you think might be beneficial, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so we're yeah, very open to feedback and ideas. Um, and um, but yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge um, some of Gustav's colleagues who've helped out. Um, the um, manufacturer of the ventilator very kindly provided Gustav with the software to enable him to download the data. Um, there's been a lot of help from, I think, some of your interns and, and other uh, colleagues. And also for um, financial support from Model Insights and from Indava. Uh, so we've put volunteer time into this, um, but we've also been very grateful for the, the funding that we've had there. So uh, to get in touch, either come and speak to us afterwards uh, or contact us in these various, various different ways. Thank you. So we've got 10 minutes for questions. Possibly open the back doors as well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Back. It's lovely the back is here. We're farming <laughs> down here. Sorry, question. Uh, you mentioned you had a different class balance. Uh, what approaches do you take to uh, try and get around that? 
Uh, that's a very good question. And uh, okay, right. So you were asking what strategies uh, we'd employ to deal with the class imbalance issue, um, and um, I honestly can't remember how I tackled that one. It's not a major issue with this set. So although we only have one true positive um, in a hundred samples, um, it's it's not been a, a big issue for us. Do you want to take? I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Giles, I think we didn't take any approach to addressing the class imbalance. Uh, the more tricky question was identifying the right features that cleanly identify the start of the breath um, in the face of all the noise and other weird features that occur. And once you've got the right set of features, the imbalance didn't become an issue. Uh, we were lucky, I think, in that case. So the question, can, the question has been that how easy is for a human eye to identify the start of the breath? Is that yes? So uh, actually, we we did that, and and uh, I started to do some manual annotation myself, and also had a student who actually did quite a lot of manual annotation for me on different patients, actually. So I have got now a training data set, which I can, or test data set, actually, which I can then use um, with any model. But um, I have to say, I've cheated a bit because I've sent the most difficult data to them uh, as to build a classifier for. So this is two extreme cases here. So the one where the baby is not breathing at all, that's very easy, of course. And the other one, which you just seen, this is a very, very difficult. So usually in clinical care, we see something in between these two extremes. And and I think myself, I can, even in this one, I have an over 90% chance, at least myself, 95 somewhere, to be very, very certain where the breath start is. But I have to look at more than what we looked at here, because my understanding in that this one is based on the flow. Why, when I'm looking at it, I'm also looking at the pressure. So I'm looking at the pressure and the flow at the same time, and, and clinic can, clinicians can reason when is the breath start based on starting looking at the flow and the pressure at the same time point on a particular curve. That's the, uh, that's the answer. So the question is... Um, whether we use both signals for the classification, and at this stage we're just using the flow. That's by far the more useful data for this. Um, it, and I'd, I'd add, in, um, you were asking about how easy it is to annotate the data. It, it is difficult, and it takes 10 to 20 minutes to annotate one minute of data, even with a GUI tool where you can slide around a timestamp to where you want it and hit the button to capture that timestamp. But there have been ambiguous, so there are breaths which I, in this data, there have been uh, breaths which even with the pressure included, I would not be able to, with high confidence, say myself, if, if this is the very start of the breath. Is there any value in looking at EMG of dioxide? Very good question. Modern ventilators, oh, okay, so is there any value of uh, looking at electromyogram of, electromyogram of diaphragm? And there is a new way of mechanical ventilation called NAVA. This is called neural assist ventilators, where actually, rather than uh, the ventilator being synchronized with the patient inspiratory flow effort, like at the level of the endotracheal tube or the airway, now the new ventilators actually have got a diaphragmatic uh, probe, like a tube which is put in a esophagus, and then it measures actually the diaphragmatic activity, diaphragmatic EMG, and it's trying to synchronize uh, with uh, it's called neural assist, neuro assist ventilators, trying to synchronize the breath of the ventilator with the diaphragmatic EMG. Now that has that's a very new approach, and some people say this is going to be the future. Some people have got criticism because the diaphragm does do things which are not mediated by the brain to start the breath, and has got diaphragmatic activity, which probably in real life don't result in ventilation. Or so, if you really want to do it, if uh, the, well our effort to breathe comes from the top. So the diaphragm does it, but the diaphragm has got extra signals, and therefore there is some criticism about the NEVA, the neural assist ventilators at the diaphragm EMG level, so that they have got other sort of impulses, other than just the one which truly represents a breathing effort. But this is 
one of the futures of mechanical ventilations, yes. Yes. Um, I think, um, so yeah, okay, so the question is, uh, yes, rightly, the purpose of intensive care is to get the patient out of intensive care. The purpose of ventilation is to take the baby off the ventilation. And that's one the reason why we're not making the baby completely sedated, because then, of course, the, the patient is not going to come off the ventilator before spontaneous breaths are started. Now, um, now to predict that is very difficult. And, and even though there has been clinical indicators, various people published various clinical indicators, what would predict the patient to uh, be able to breathe without the tube. What, I, what we usually see to the, say to the parents is that we don't know before we pull the tube. But, uh, but the reality is that I think in the longer term, I, I strongly believe that computers are going to ventilate better than clinicians. And, um, and that's because they will be able to rely on more data and more indicators and more frequent data than what clinicians do. So clinicians do an experience-based, very simple kind of knowledge-based algorithm of how when I'm thinking the baby is getting ready, which is very simple. And, and therefore, I think there is a sort of 20% 20 20 intub extubation failure, or 10 to 20% extubation failure. I think, yes, the answer is yes, but I don't know how to sort of achieve that. <laughs> Uh, no, this is not a product. This is an interest-based collaboration here with uh, yeah. me and, and, and two pro computer programmers. We haven't received any funding for it. We are not, uh, you know, I, the Jager kindly um, provided me this, uh, this um, uh, to cable and software to download the data, but I have got no conflict, in conflict of interest. I have received nothing else from Jager, and, uh, and, and I think we have been working on this from enthusiasm and, and just to try to understand more about mechanical ventilation, and that's what's driving me. I'm a, I'm a full-time clinician as well. Just to add on that, so the intention is just to open source the results uh, with some open journal publications when we're ready for that. So it's not intended to be a commercial product. Here we're solving and a problem that's interesting uh, from... Yeah, so what you meant is even if it's open source, how far do you think it's from actually putting it in the hospital and using it on the machine to uh, mm. <laughs> Very far. <laughs> So the question was about the the data set and the number of breaths we have in it. Uh, this one. Yeah. Um, this is this is one minute of data. Um, babies breathe approximately once a second, so we have um, approximately 60 peaks in here in the in the flow. Um, and in this case, the ventilator is assisting, so we also have corresponding peaks in pressure. But this is a 100 hertz sample rate. So if you want to call the start of a breath, um, and so you have approximately 100 samples um, to, a, to a breath, that, that's approximately the length of a breath. And you potentially have 100 start points um, where you don't know I don't think we have a, well, if I come to here, so sample zero, the breath is initiated, and by sample 100, um, the breath is all done. Um, I think most of these are probably stopping after around 0 0.8, 0 0.9 of a second. But the point is, if we want to segment the breaths, we, we need to be able to predict which um, position in our series is the start. Um, and so... You know, we can be 
we can be off by 10 milliseconds and that matters. If we're off by one or, sorry, we'll be off by 100 milliseconds and that matters. If we're off by 10 or 20, that doesn't matter so much. But yeah, imagine um, all of these joined together end to end and it gets you back to this portion of this plot. Does that answer the, the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Slightly silly question. How did you find the start of a crack in a water? So um, I saw. I told you that uh, the breath is when 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 the inspiration is positive flow, when flow starts, right? Uh, so in a way, it would be very straightforward. When the positive flow starts, that's the start of the breath. Now, the problem is that there can be scenarios when the baby is starting a breath and then the ventilator is still in the expiratory phase. Well, even without that, I mean, with my own children, you often observe that they start, hold, start. Yes. And do that. So, what, I mean, you know, that's quite common. So, how would you find the start? Uh, I mean, def definition wise, the start of the breath in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in any individual who hasn't got two pumps, just one pump, is very straightforward because whenever the, the positive flow starts, when I'm starting, t when, when positive flow starts to go in through my mouth or nose, in through my lung, positive flow is inward flow. That's the start of the breath. I mean, you can define the breath differently, like, for example, when is the neural signal or the diaphragmatic signal for that breath, but that would require access to those, those signals directly. Uh, from a practical perspective, from a clinical perspective, the best is to define the breath at a, at a level where you can assess it. And we have got a proximal flow sensor near the endotracheal tube, so we can measure the flow very, very carefully there, and we can identify the start of the breath there. Yep. Yeah, we, 